no doubt that the importance of an art trade and art dealers in the history of modern collecting is immense. Usually as evidence of names of the prominent art dealers who are companions and patrons of later famous artists and became promoters of new art movements as Ambroise Vollard, Daniel Kahnweiler and Paul Rosenberg in Paris or Paul Kazirer and Alfred Flechtheim in Berlin of the Weimar Republic. The subject of my interest, however, are traditional, typical art dealers, Kunsthandlers, in Polish at the end of the 19th and in the first half of the 20th centuries, called also art antiquarians. I want to talk about them not only because in Poland until 1939, practically, there were no dealers consistently involved in the promotion of contemporary modern art. This was done in the interior period by associations of artists, critics, and patrons such as Institut Propagandy, Stuki Institute of Art Propaganda. But I want to talk about them also because everywhere in Europe at that time, traditional art dealers, that is owners of shops, salons, galleries, auction houses, specialized in the professional sale of arts and crafts as well as antiquities, prevailed on the art market and set its rules far from those who promote and represent chosen living artists and whom we rather call today gallerists. The capital of each serious art dealer, apart from his knowledge, intuition, entrepreneurship and professional contacts is determined by his circle of regular clients, among them above all prominent art collectors. They are a guarantee of the quality of the objects he offers as of the trust they have in him. This was also the case in pre-war Warsaw, where the community of art dealers, collectors of various fields, museum curators and conservators was relatively small, linked socially and professionally, and even topographically in a quarter of the streets in the elegant city center. Jewish art dealers and Jewish collectors, the latter were the subject of Milena's paper yesterday, played a great role in this group. This is evidenced by exhibition catalogs of the time, museum inventories, newspapers, memoirs, etc. The two elder brothers, Gutnayer, Bernard and Abe, are among the most important actors in this circle until September 1939. Josef, the youngest Gutnayer, who specialized in selling antique furniture, was of a more modest status. <clears throat> the family business of Gutnayer's began by trading in old things, a specialty dominated by Jewish merchants. In the neighborhood of a flea market, the first Steve in the selection of antiques. It was in this part of Warsaw that the good Nair's father, Ludwig, opened an antique shop in the 1880s in a small one store house. From the end of the 19th century, his widow Lea ran the shop with her adolescent son's help. I quote, you came in through the kitchen, which was full of copper pots. After crossing the kitchen, you walked into a fairly large room with cupboards and beds, which were arranged as if it were a private home. And behind these cupboards and beds, and also on the walls were lots of paintings. But what quality paintings? One of long-standing Gutnayer's customers recalled. The first own antique store of younger brother Gutnayer, Abbe, opened before 1914, was still a little shop similar to a junk store. Two years later, it moved into a larger and more elegant place and became specialized mainly in paintings. In 1917, Abbe organized the first group exhibition of several Polish painters already accompanied by a catalog. In 1920, he transferred his salon to really representative rooms on the second floor of a building in the most fashionable street of Warsaw. A visitor of the new salon confirmed this qualitative leap when he went to see an exhibition of paintings by the best Polish painters of the late 19th and early 20th centuries and strolled around the rooms which were beautifully decorated, witnessing the firm thriving brilliantly. It was one of two exhibitions opened at Abbe Gutnayer's Salon in 1924, which featured several canvases by famous Polish landscape painter, painter bought by Abbe from the Fournier collection in Paris, and over a hundred items from the legendary collection of paintings owned by the Count Ignacy Korwin-Mileski, 
who died abroad two years later. Abbe acquired in Vienna the greatest part of his collection. To make the quality of the works presented clear, it's enough to say that a significant part of them was later purchased from Gutnaya by the Warsaw National Museum, and to this day they are considered to be the most outstanding works of the authors. Abbe's Salon of Art operated primarily as a gallery of paintings. Even though he did not shun old European masters, Russian painters, and even icons, it was 19th and early 20th century Polish painting that took pride of place in what he had on offer. He acquired it domestically from the collections of impoverished aristocratic families, in addition to antique items of various crafts, but mainly bought them abroad, like those already mentioned, or to give other example, a large number of works from former tsarist and private collections, which had been nationalized by the Soviet government, had put on auction in Berlin. Alone in his ambitious foreign pursuits, the younger Gutnaya would take out bank loans to buy what interested him. But as he became wealthy, loans became unnecessary. Professional illustrated catalogues accompanied majority of Abbe's exhibitions. Each of its opening was announced in the newspapers and gathered a fine audience. For his best clients, Gutnaya organized occasionally special auctions. For the less demanding and more modest clientele, on the other hand, he opened in the mid 20s, virtually vis a vis his salon of painting, the antique shop with etchings and decorative art objects, furniture, tapestries, porcelain, silver, old jewelry, etc. In the late 30s, in addition, he organized several large um, commercial shows outside Warsaw in Łódź and Katowice. To promote his business, the younger of two Gutnayas donated few paintings to the National Museum in Warsaw and used to loan paintings he owned to prestigious public exhibitions. Abbe Gutnaya was well liked in Warsaw culture and collector circles. He was respected for his knowledge, his competence in acquiring, item, acquiring items and the high standards he maintained in dealing with customers. They included museums and government offices, as well as tycoons and the prosperous intelligentsia of the free professions, many of whom he inspired to collect art, especially works of Polish masters. In the 1930s, the conservative nature of his business dictated mainly, also not only by demand, by presumably also by his own taste, gave also society an ironic neologism for conservative taste, abegutnayerism. In artistic circles, some people were surprised that Gutnaya, a Jew, did not touch modern art. Even though he traveled frequently to Paris and Berlin, where modern art became increasingly accepted, it never really sparked his interest, although his offer in the 1930s included Chagall's painting. The younger of two brothers, Gutnaya, had gained fame above all for bringing home high quality paintings by Polish famous artists, previously unknown to the national audience, that he found and bought at auctions and in private collections abroad, many of which he then sold to Polish museums. His exhibitions in strongly influenced the canon of Polish painting of the second half of the 19th and early 20th century, which for a lot of years became a guideline for many art collectors. And in fact, has remained to a large extent to this day. Nothing unusual that only a small number of foreigners were among the clients of the Abbe's Salon of Painting and his antique shop, and if they were, they bought rather antiquities and jewelry. It is possible that Gutnaya, who was knowledgeable about many art and handicraft genres and aware of the limitations of the Polish art market, thought about moving his business to Berlin or about opening a branch there. This speculation is supported by his purchases of several properties there, and even more by the fact that between 1933 and 1936, he was spending most of his time in the German capital. Even if he really had such plans, he ultimately dropped them in the wake of Nazi pressure on Jews to Aryanize their property. Since 1937, Abegutnaya had focused on his business in Poland. 
as well as running the Salon, putting on exhibitions and auctions, the last one in June 1939 of Hendrik Levenfeld's collection. He visited manor houses and palaces, even in remote areas of the country, in search of interesting objects. People remember this very handsome and elegant gentleman examining furniture with a flashlight and magnifying glass or climbing ladders to touch a tapestry to inspect its weave. Little is known about Abbe Gutner's private collection, apart from the fact that the family's apartment above his gallery boasted paintings, antique furniture, tapestries, and other valuable objects. And that he just before the outbreak of the Second War deposited several dozen of his most precious paintings in a bank safe. It was all gone. That's, of course, a different topic. However, in the context of our conference, <clears throat> it is worth asking if and when an art dealer becomes an art collector. The answer to these general questions must and can vary depending on many external circumstances and above all on the interests of the individual dealer. It is well known that many of them, regardless of their profession, were and are passionate collectors and their collections often used to be excellent. In the case of Abbe Gutnayer, it seems reasonable to answer these questions and doubtful and negative. Yes, he was the owner of paintings which he exhibited and sold. He certainly had more than one painting and many other valuable objects in his private apartment, which he did not enter to part with. But he was definitely acquiring works of art in order to sell them and not to collect them. In this attitude, he differed radically from his eight year older brother, Bernard. This is all the more surprising since Bernard Gudnayer was the president of the Association of Polish Art Dealers, Art Antiquarians. And like Abbe, Bernard had no interest in publicity. Nonetheless, it was he whom those in the know considered Poland's wealthiest art dealer and legions were told about his collection. Bernard had assumed responsibility for the family antique business, which in the turn of the 20th century still resembled a junk shop. When Poland became independent in 1918, he moved it to a street level humble space in the Hotel Angielski across the street from the palace occupied by the Minister of Foreign Affairs. Bernard's Salon of Art and Antiquities remained in this relatively small room where the owner dealt mostly in old silver and china to the end of its days in September of 1939. According to contemporary accounts, it resembled a treasure-filled bric-a-brac shop with its, I quote, few paintings, most of them in the window for advertising. Striking was that it always held splendid objects which his visitors knew intimately since to the amazement of those not in the know, the display was not changed for years. End of the quotation. Uh, no, it's not the end of the quotation. Asked how his business was going, Bernard would reply, I'm convinced that there are 24 people in Poland who have a daily income of several thousand zlotys. It is enough if every other year I sell each one of them just one object, a valuable piece of furniture or a piece of jewelry as an investment and the quotation. No wonder that the National Museum of Warsaw bought only a few items from him, including a painting by Hendrik Ten Terbruen, because it could not afford Bernard's high prices. The oldest of the Goodnight brothers had namely a business strategy of trying not to part from his collection, setting inflated prohibitive sale prices on the art on offer in his salon. This strategy is confirmed in a letter dated November 1936 from the eldest of his four sons, Ludwig, who worked in the shop with his father, to his brother Henrik, who was living in Paris. I quote, we could be doing better were if not for that is stubbornness. End of the quotation. This stubbornness is easier to understand when one knows what extraordinary objects were on display in the Bernard Salon but mainly hidden in Bernard's family private apartment. He owned, among others, several hundred pieces of silver by Peter Carl Fabergé, 
some 215 Sajin Center Judaica, at least 140 silver objects made by famous European manufacturers, including 16th and 17th century cups produced in Augsburg and Nuremberg, and a collection of antique jewelry, which included 75 18th century decorated gold snuff boxes, as well as intricate rings and necklaces. Bernard's collection of paintings included some Dutch and French masters, among them Isaac von Ostado, Robert Robert, produced by Canaletto, numerous icons, and even a canvas by Maurice Kissling. This letter, I suppose, this was a gift of his two sons who studied architecture in Paris. The largest part of his collection were Polish painters. The creator and artistic handicrafts in the Warsaw National Museum, described after the war, the collection he had known before September 1939 in the Bernard's private apartment as seeming to surpass in quality and quantity the things that could be found in his store. I quote, apart from several hundred Polish paintings, Bernard Goodnight owned a large number of decorative art objects. Outstanding among them was furniture, Polish as well as foreign, most importantly, enormous Gdańsk wardrobes and other 17th and 18th century ones, sculpted or with intarsias and gold plated, some mahogany and smooth. Antique hanging mirrors and chandeliers put the finishing touches of the, on the interior of the large apartment. Furthermore, Bernard owned a huge number of rugs, mostly old Persian ones and later Oriental, also from the Caucasus and Turkey. Some lay on the floor, and the most valuable ones, such as the silk, gold, treated Persian ones, hang on the walls, mostly in stacks on the floor or inside the large antique wardrobes. Apart from athletic styles, such as valuable tapestries, he also owned a large number of contouch sashes interwoven with gold and silver thread. Finally, Bernard had a very large collection of old for, uh, foreign silver from the best manufacturers, as well as Polish silver. Outstanding among his metalwork was an enorm enormous collection of Jewish silver made both in Poland and abroad. Several hundred ceramic objects were a discrete sizable part of the collection. Apart from the valuable foreign porcelain objects from Meissen and Vienna, the largest collection, some of it very valuable, was Polish. A few years before the war, Bernard brought 12 plates from the so-called Sultan service, service Turk from Paris. End of the quotation. The Warsaw dealer bought the Sultan plates at De la Vie Russe shop in the Rue de la, du Faubourg Saint-Honoré in Paris. After the war, it, its owner, Lon Greenberg, confirmed that the Bernard Goodnight Company was regarded as the most important speciality in Poland, and that as such, it maintained extensive commercial connections with the largest antique dealers and collectors in Europe. End of the quotation. The oldest Gutnai was not only a business partner, but often also an excellent customer, not put, off, not put off by high prices. He could afford them, since apart from managing his salon of art and antiquities, he traded in both rough and cut diamonds, which he imported directly from Amsterdam and Anvers. Bernard Gutnai's entire collection disappeared after 1939 without trace. Bernard himself, like his two younger brother, and most of his and their family members died in the Warsaw Ghetto. As an art dealer, was Bernard undoubtedly more old fashioned than his brother Abel. But he also clearly didn't care about competing in this regard with his younger brother or other Warsaw art dealers. Nevertheless, to his faithful clients belonged some of the prominent collectors in the country, as well as foreign diplomats and politicians. As an art collector, Bernard seemed to be a compulsive gatherer with a passion for collecting high quality objects that he jealously hid from unauthorized eyes. As one can see, in many ways, he was the complete opposite of his younger brother, Abel. In conclusion, it took the two brothers, Gutnaya, only several years to rise from the level of trash merchants to the high prestige and leading professional position among Warsaw art dealers and the corresponding recognition among Polish art collectors. Their relationship with the latter were manifold. They inspired, 
advised, set standards of artistic quality, found the works desired by their clients. But they also dictated prices, exaggerated in pricing the objects, discounted their knowledge when confronted with their clients' naivety or their overwhelming passion for collecting. Unless, like Bernard himself, he was a victim of this passion. Thank you very much. I'm very excited to present uh, such an exciting topic uh, about antiquity collecting um, at the end of the 19th century, at the turn of the 20th century. And the subtitle I, um, I added, Désenchantement or Metamorphosis, because um, I hope that we have a um, stronger idea about at the end of, the of this talk. So let's start. If the century of la jeunesse des musées has been the one where national museums mainly gathered their prestigious Greco-Roman and Assyrian collections, this movement underwent a turning point by the end of the 19th century. Until then, the Louvre and the British Museum have been the um, have been the two main museums which played a structuring role on the public art market. Antiques collecting knew then a new impetus with the triumph of the art market and the diverse international auctions held in Paris, in London, and other international cities in parallel of the world art fairs. The role and the origins of private collectors highly evolved from the beginning to the end of the 19th century. At the beginning of the 19th century, private collectors were mainly aristocrats, very few of them, not to say any of them, were um, from the bourgeoisie, either was it upper or middle. Most famous antiques collectors were the Comte de choisel gouffier were the Comte de choisel gouffier and the Earl of Elgin, Le Comte d'Elgin, who both tried to take back the porcelain marbles to their respective country, successfully for the English part, who acquired them for the British Museum in, um, in 1816. But compared to those aristocratic figures, we can observe how the profile of the collectors changed during the Belle Epoque till the First World War. Indeed, from that turning point, um, antique gentlemen connoisseurs played an increasing role and horizons changed. Collecting merged with colonialism more than ever before, as military and diplomats and diplomats officers were often art collectors, and the disenchantment we are facing has to be rooted in many reasons. In, the, in this talk, we can more or less define four of them, which will be firstly, the development of the legal frame, then the development of the national archeology, span then the development of the bourgeoisie and the action cells, and then le, last but not least, we will focus uh, on the merging between collecting and colonialism. Firstly, the development of the legal frame, so let's have a deeper look at this key driver of change, because all along the 19th century, collectors dealt with local authority accordingly to the existence or non-existence of the national and international legal framework. It means in our case, uh, uh, with the almost pure non-consideration for Greek antiquity from the Ottoman authorities, it allowed England to acquire the personal marble, the Alicarnassus mausoleum, among many others. And in those cases, the difficulty didn't come from um, the legal framework, but from the international rivalry to acquire those architect architectural remains. The archives of the Louvre and the British Museum are full of 
witnesses about uh, uh, this um, this uh, this this rivalry. For example, here we can uh, read in a, in a paper that the French and Austrian governments were uh, interested in the um, uh, in the Holy Cornus Mausoleum search at the Academy de Berlin and and the, the inventor of this uh, of those archaeological remains said that his first wish was um, has been that they should be placed in the British Museum. So the um, the main difficulty didn't come, didn't come from the legal framework, but from the uh, the um, rivalry from other museums. International attention was mainly focused on the Middle East coast, as Greece newly raised a juridical framework after um, the country got her independence. Uh, a juridical framework versus the irreversible export of cultural objects she has been the victim of for decades while under the domination of the sublime port. This Greek legal framework is the first witness of the raising of a cultural awareness in Oriental Mediterranean Sea. The lack of legal frame enhances the development of private collections collected by some collectors paying sometimes themselves for the excavation. Those collections then imported to Western Europe were sold in auction sales, establishing somehow a strong link between archaeological activity and business activity. Clandestine excavations feed the art market and private collections, whereas official excavations feed exclusively museums. We had to wait far in the second part of the 19th century to see some laws about cultural heritage established in the Ottoman Empire, which covered at that time the Oriental Mediterranean coast. The first laws were edited in 1869 and then in 1874, but they were not very respected till the Ottoman public proclamation in 18. 80, um, 84. This, this proclamation was inspired by the painter and archaeologist Hamdi Bey, who is considered as a pioneer of the museum curator's profession in Turkey. He was also the founder of the Istanbul Archaeology uh, Museum and also its first director, and also the founder of the Istanbul Academy of Fine Arts. And uh, the law he proclaimed says it's strictly forbidden to export any of Ottoman antiquities. Thus, thus, it seems that the era of free collecting from the excavation site to Occidental museums, such as the Louvre and the British Museum, is definitely over. It is also true to say that museums became more and more focused on structuring their acquisitions and welcoming them in their desperately too small venues, um, too small venues filled to the brim. For example, the Museum of Orichalnosis we have been talking about, before entering, before properly entering the museum, it remained 20 years, 20 years in boxes in the courtyard colonnade of the British Museum before properly entering the building and being given a real room to be admired. So a quick overview on this period could let us conclude that this new legal frame and this lack of room is the main reason national museums moved over officially from the antiquity collecting field. But a deeper look shows how reality is different. Let's start, let's continue with the development of the national archaeology. Because the development of the national archaeology considerably changed the anticomani field, it considerably helped the appearance of small, very small collectors. We observe a sharp decrease of clergymen and aristocracy who were mainly focused on classics, Greek and Roman antiquity having been their main field of studies. 
So here we'll focus for uh, one or two minutes only on the fresh example, but similarities can be established, for example, in Germany, where the Romish Germanische Central Museum in Mayence was founded in 1854 um, uh, and in many other countries. A turning point of this collecting movement in France is the opening of the Musée des Antiquités Nationales in 1867, which considerably increased the interest in local heritage. The, connoiss the connoisseurship practice seemed then more accessible and more small collectors appeared in parallel of development of diverse learned societies, such as the Société des Antiquaires, the Société Française d'Archéologie, and ETC. The collecting practice is absolutely indissociable from a prestigious social status, and many collectors played a major role in the auction sales, being sometimes themselves collectors and auctioneurs, such as such was uh, Félix Bien-Aimé Feu Ardent. And uh, for the third point, the development of the bourgeoisie and the auction sales, because the auction sales uh, considerably developed in the, um, in the second part of the 19th century and at the turning point of the 20th century. The end of the 19th century is also the, is also the century where colonialism and imperialism began to develop. It had a huge impact on our field. It considerably increased the possibility for military officers to help themselves in conquer the lands, but that way of collecting was directly inspired from the merging between diplomacy and collecting we already observed previously. What we do observe henceforth is a new profile of private collectors, those who barely or even never travel themselves, at least not beyond the auction halls, and who got the, their fortunes and devoted to collecting thanks to the industrial revolutions. Paris, London, Berlin, Geneva are full of those kind of collectors. Let's introduce some of them, asking each time two questions. We'll focus on one, way, on one hand in the, growing, uh, in the growing of a collection during the lifetime of the owner. And on the other hand, we also have to wonder what's happened to private collections after the death of the owner. Firstly, let's introduce the Frères du Thuy, Auguste and Eugène, and also their sister Eloise, but her role is still to be precisely defined. Uh, they were born in Normandy, in Rouen, precisely, from a family of cotton factory owners. Auguste and Eugène collected an important collection around um, uh, 20,000 pieces, mainly paintings and engravings, but also antiques. They, knew, um, they know very well Rome and they lent to the Paris World Art Fair in 1867 uh, some pieces of their collections acquired in previous Parisian auction sales. They bought frequently new pieces in Italy, but also in London or elsewhere, giving, instruct, uh, giving instructions to cover, to cover as many art markets as possible. But they never commissioned excavations abroad. When their sister Eloise died, they began thinking about the fate of their collections. And when Auguste died at the age of 90, he wrote in his testament, all those collections have been gathered after 50 years of efforts by three people with a main goal, to be useful to the audience in a popular location which could be seen by workers. This is why they, they bequeathed their collection to the Musée de la Ville de Paris, um, served with a, a plaque du Thuy or this mirror in, in the form of a carriated. And we have to keep in mind that competition was very intense, not only on the excavation fields, but in the auction, auction hall um, also. Because now let's introduce the Count Tiskevitz, known as the Count Polacco in Italy, who was the main rival of the Frère du Thuy. He was born in Lithuania in 1898, and he settled himself in Rome in 1865, where he died at the turning point of the 20th century. 
He is described as the most passionate, passionate and prodigal buyers of antiques. Nowadays, the collection is divided between the Louvre, the British Museum, and the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. He organized himself some excavation in Egypt and in the Middle East, but remained, however, more known for his active participation in auction sales than an archaeologist himself. He's known as someone who quickly gets bored by his own objects, so he kept, uh, he kept buying and buying new ones to always entertain, entertain himself, if I might say. His collection is then, a perpetual, is then in a perpetual movement and also one of the rare, which contains oriental objects, such as the winged ibex, backed by the Louvre when Tiskevitz died. So Tiskevitz is a kind, I would say, a kind of transition between the Frère Dutuy, who never went on the field themselves, on the excavation site. The Count Tiskevitz did, but he played a role which, were, which was much more important in the auction sales. And then let's focus on the collecting and colonialism merging. We have to keep in mind that collecting have existed at all time, even in antiquity itself. That means this phenomenon is not new, definitely not new. But what's new is the, pilot, the political dimension due to colonialism, which enhances this phenomenon. Cultural appropriation and spoliation became then almost a natural form of colonialism by absorbing both physically and legally objects and works of art. Indeed, collecting is bound to a social category of high dignitaries, consuls, drugmen, and European industrialists who wanted to feed their national museums and private collections. At the period we are talking about, the most important acquisitions are from Africa, opening henceforth the path to a new kind of museums, which doesn't mean that main museums such as the Louvre and the British Museum didn't receive a part of the cake. For example, in 1897, the Benin City Expedition uh, uh, provided to the, to the British Museum um, hundreds of objects. And uh, also it um, opens the, the path to, the, um, to new kind of museum, ethnographical and colonial museums, for example, in Brussels in 1910, it was the opening of the Terburan Colonial Museum. It's very hard to talk about this subject because today this phenomenon is highly criticized for ethical reasons, national reasons, and many others. But I would also add from a strictly archaeological point of view, what we can deeply regret is that this collecting phenomenon was only focused on the object, not the context, the culture and the environment, which leads us to a paradox that a real cultural disaster made for aesthetic reasons, asking, of course, the main questions, who owns antiquity? Of course, we don't pretend to answer this huge question in a, smudge, in, a such, in a such small amount of time. Even a full conference wouldn't be enough. But we can try to introduce examples of uh, collectors who illustrate this phenomenon. There are, of course, plenty of them. At the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, there were many private collectors who were dignitaries in conquest countries who wanted to create a private museum. And the one I choose is Louis Carton. His name is Louis Carton. 
He was born in 1861. He died after the First World War in the 20s, in 1924. And here, the social profile of this collector is completely different from the one we've been talking about previously, the Frère du Thuy and uh, Ardon and the Comte Skevit. It's completely different because He's at the crossroad of many, many, many fields. He's a military officer, and he was 100% in favor of the Tunisia conquest, whose he wished that la France soit la gardienne du passé et la protectrice de l'avenir. He's a doctor, he's a military doctor, and he's also a real archeologist. But he was definitely more interested in archaeology than in medicine because he published dozens of books about archaeology and he wrote maybe one, two or three papers about um, his, um, his specialty, his strong point in medicine. And, and moreover, he was often reproached. Um, Digger. Was... Digger. I'm sorry. He was often reproached to leave his functions at, at hospital for excavating reasons. He founded the Société Archéologique de Sousse, which still exists, Sousse, where he excavated the catacombs, and also he kept fighting his whole life for the preservation of the antique site of Carthage. He's one of the main donators of one of the richest collection of the department of the Département des Antiquités Grecques, Etrusques et Romaines of the Louvre, the Tunisian Antiquities. And something I quite like in this collector, he didn't donate only to the Louvre, but also to newborn Tunisian museums, such as the Sousse Museum, the Bardo Museums, and the, Cart the Carthage Museum. But we can't hide, we really can't hide. His activity as a collector was very controversial. His mention, his private mention, was full, really full of antiquities he collected and he kept for himself, for his own pleasure to him and his wife, who was also very interested in, in archaeology, and she founded a um, uh, Cercle des Hautes Femmes Intéressées par l'Archéologie in, uh, in Tunisia. It's like he founded an open-air colonial museum. So, of course, today it's a way of collecting which is very, very, very criticized. It's highly criticized. And it shows, at that time, it shows the social status of the, um, of the collector. It was not enough to be a military officer, to be um, a doctor. It was not enough. The social status was also um, seen by the possession of a large antique um, antique uh, collection. The position, to conclude, the position of a collection always remained a symbol of personal economic success, but this practice played a major role at the turning point of the 20th century to establish his social status. Antiquity collecting didn't mean the same throughout the century. It became, it became a new tool to establish a social situation, reflecting both societal value and evolving art market. And from a general point of view, it also shows the rejuvenation of the heritage conception in, may, in favor of a more modern concept of chosen and national, not to say local heritage. It makes sense in the Belle Epoque, in the Belle Epoque context, where increasing national pride was combined to the, strength, to, the strength, to the structuring of the scientific 
and archaeological field. At the end of the Belle Epoque, after the shock of the First World War, collecting still existed, but was not practiced in the same way as the social category we are dealing with, the bourgeoisie, deeply evolved economically, economically and culturally. It would be interesting to wonder how it was then developed between the two world wars, but what is sure is that antiquity collecting at the turn of the 20th century saw the seeds of the actual international restitution claims we are still facing nowadays. Thank you. A question uh, from Marcela, yes, to Navojka. Navojka, thank you for your very interesting speech. I'm happy that we had this subject here. One minor question. Did you find uh, in your research any marks of art business context to the Bohemia Czech lands, uh, not only for Gutnaya, but elsewhere in the art business during these years? Thank you. Uh, I will answer quickly. Yes, I, I, I found few, uh, few connections before the war and during the war. Before the war, this, this, this was especially from from uh, Krakow and uh, Lwów, this, they, they were different uh, art dealers. And during the war, this was also interesting, namely um, uh, from the um, uh, uh, art salons, uh, uh, which were under the Troja, uh, uh, which were under so-called Troja, German Troja. One, uh, one was one bought things in 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 uh, Krakow and uh, with. Uh, um, Art market uh, by let's say by the in the in 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 Bremen, Czech as in protectorate. So I, I I know it. We can just exchange it uh, by email in more detailed way. Okay, um, Naveka, I have also a question. Like it's. Um... The, the interesting thing in, in it's, it's that the, the problem or the history of Gutnaya brothers is, is definitely something, um, I think something which you were writing about, about Gutnaya's. I think this is, uh, I don't know how, how much we know or we can find out about their, their, their history. It's already a lot what you were presenting to us. This is, I think most interesting is to to find out where's this borderline between this what they were doing as uh, as art dealers and this uh, this kind of uh, of of uh, let's say real fascination and and passion for Polish art this Gutnayerism, the term you were you were using which I think was um, I think Swanimski. Uh, came with it was was of course in in ne negative sense it was like this is this is uh, he used it to call this passion for for art which was already um, at that time more more let's say uh, anachronic yes this was this was but still they found it so the question my question would be what do you think if if their passion for this Polish art was more because this art was so um, uh, so appreciated and there was a clientele for it, or was it was it more that they were shaping the taste of of the collecting scene? Were they influencing it because they they approached? Uh, the collector and say said hey look here's Helmonski he's great you have you 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 have to get him or or uh, other way around was it like this that they were the the the, the collectors were asking uh, Gutmeier to get them some Helmonski or Gerimski so what do you think what is your opinion you know, of course, let's say good nights. This they they are only two. I mean, they they were leading uh, um, uh, leading art dealers in, in in Warsaw, but there were quite a lot in Warsaw and also in in Krakow and Lwów. So, if I could answer generally, I I suppose that uh, and this this one even uh, shows uh, sees the difference between both brothers. I mean, good night, Bernard and uh, and uh, Abe. But I would say, mm, at first, 
that uh, mm, uh, you mentioned uh, Gerimsky and you mentioned Hermoyski, but they always, they, they also solve, let's say, contemporary artists, I mean, in the sense of Vispiansky and Marcheski and Mehofer, so who are, and who are still in the history of art of this period, I mean, uh, uh, highly respected artists and Gerimsky as well. So if you think about it, that, let's say, uh, Gerimsky and then Brandt and uh, mm, uh, uh, I don't know which, which this, Munich artists, they were, uh, they belong to the very well sold artists all over Europe in one way. So what I want to say that in this respect, they uh, developed the very special attitude towards them. Of course, they, they like this art, obviously, but they also very, uh, uh, very clearly understood the difference of quality of uh, different artists. This is very often connected with uh, with art dealer and with uh, with with special very good art dealers. This was the case. So that was the reason also they could sell really the best examples of this of these painters. And it was not by chance they were ready to pay a lot of money by 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 in Berlin and also in Vienna to buy Pol and in Paris. Uh, to buy Polish artists and their best pieces. So I would say that in the case of, uh, of um, good nights, we really do not have to do with collectors, but uh, they, were, they, they were also art dealers who collected obviously, and who collected very chosen and very decisive just uh, part of, uh, of art or different, the best quality objects. So, it is as 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 I told in this in this in my remarks. This is always very individual uh, uh, case. One has to to see also just uh, uh, among let's say German or French uh, art dealers the same. Some of them only collected, uh, did not collect, only sold, and other just uh, collected and very very chosen um, artists or very chosen objects. So. It is, it, is, it is in one way, answer yes and no. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's a very in interesting to topic, uh, this, this um, uh, let's say, problem of this, how art dealers were influencing this uh, art collecting scene. I think this is uh, something, uh, yes, we could talk about uh, colonialism in, um, in, uh, in the field of collecting and also art market, like there are so many various aspects we could probably um, devote the extra uh, uh, webinar, at least one. So it's, it's, it's really fascinating. Still one, uh, one question from Ulrike Schmiegelt. Uh, from uh, Schmiegelt, she's asking Navojka, you said the collection of Bernau, Bernard Baruch Gutnaya disappears with, uh, without a trace. Do you think that by any chance there might be documents still to be retrieved, retrieved somewhere? How much research on that has been done so far? <laughs> I can answer this, this uh, simply because uh, uh, I made this research and uh, 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 this is a problem, namely they were, uh, his, uh, uh, his property uh, was confiscated just in the early days of the German occupation because he really lived to uh, uh, his, his private apartment uh, was just very close to the um, Pawat Saski where was the uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs this was very elegant part of uh, of Warsaw, and uh, uh, they were, I mean, just the, the good night Bernard and uh, and his wife uh, and uh, his two sons who uh, were then in Poland. They were simply just uh, uh, sent out from this uh, apartment, and everything, everything, very quickly in the beginning, and really in the beginning of September, uh, 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 was uh, uh, taken by. By uh, by the 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 occupiers. Who are they? This I was looking for um, for that whether it was still Wehrmacht or already let's say the, the civil administration. It's, it's without it is without trace. And uh, the problem with Bernard was that he um, uh, also exhibited very very rarely objects which he possessed. This was this um, this his very special compulsive attitude, and it means that 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 uh, in his case 
in his in 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 his collection we really do not have traces we have few traces of uh, abe gutnayer one thing was uh, uh, was even one painting was uh, found and uh, in 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 uh, in one of the um, auctions i do not remember now in london or in in new york and uh, it was uh, uh, let's say restituted and then sold partly between the the, the possessor and then the um, uh, the um, heirs of um, Abbe's son uh, Ludwig, the only the only uh, person of this family who survived uh, um, survived the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Now we switch the topic to uh, to 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 uh, back to colonialism. Uh, one question or comment from Camila. My comment to Odile, I have some doubts about combining archaeological collections with ethnological collections at the turn of the 20th century. I understand that ethnological collections included objects from excavations, traces of ancient cultures, but still, for the most part, the, they consisted of works from uh, existing cultures. At, the at that time, moreover, ethnological collections were just as often combined with natural history collections, not with archaeological ones. Um, <clears throat> so thank you, Camilla, for this comment, because I'm sorry if I didn't make, uh, didn't make it uh, clear enough. It's true that uh, there are two, um, two, two parallel Two, two phenomena in parallel, the constitution of archaeological collections and the constitution, constitution sorry, of ethnological collections. That's true. That's completely true. And uh, it, it might have been made sometimes by uh, the same collectors, but most of the time they were focused on either on existing cultures or, for example, on antiquity, on uh, Roman civilizations. And most of the time they were not specialized on the two field the two fields in the same time and it's also true that uh, those collections were not combined when they were uh, sent to to museums and uh, we can see it in the structuration of the different department of the, for example, of the British Museum, the new born uh, natural and history museums was founded in, uh, in the 80s of the 19th century. So it's completely in the center of our period. Uh, it's the moment where we started a real difference between existing cultures and antique cultures with artifacts. They were from different fields, so they needed two different um, department and two different uh, uh, kind of curators to be to be cared for. So the department of the Greek and Roman antiquities in the department in the British Museum was founded in the 60s. The Natural and History Museum in the 80s, it remained uh, closely connected till the second part of the, um, of the 20th century, they had strong connections, but that's true. It was uh, two different kinds of collections. So thank you for pointing that out. And I'm sorry if it was not clear now, so thank you for your precision. Okay, thank you. And um, my question to you, Odile, would be, um, you were mentioning Louis Carton, as uh, as uh, as the one collector who was different than uh, Tariq uh, Tui and Tishkevich, yes, that the, he was uh, somehow somehow different. Uh, like he was also donating his his collection to uh, Tunisian uh, museums, yes. Could you more specify what makes him? Uh, why you uh, you? Um, you think that he's somehow exceptional was like there's any evidence in his maybe like in in, in uh, written sources like his approach was somehow different and maybe more 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 like empathic or i don't know how to call it in this context of this this rivalry and this very here we have also the problem of very, of very masculine collecting which i think it's it's also 
interesting in in the context of of all those motifs of of collecting like like rivoli is is one of the motifs which is very important and creates this collecting drive yes and and i think it's somehow also associated with with this kind of a uh, masculine let's say way of collecting where uh, yes where, where rivalization is a very important factor so could you specify maybe uh, why you you think carton was was different than others uh, for the masculine way of collecting, I chose also um, the Frère Dutuy and uh, Louis Carton because uh, either her, um, his wife or his um, sister, mm -hmm. their sister, played a major role in the constitution of the collection. So I thought it was uh, interesting to, uh -huh. to, to quote Lady Carton and uh, Eloise, uh, and Eloise Dutuy. Yes, they played uh, an important role. Of the, in the constitution of the of the collection of uh, their of um, her husband, either her husband or her brothers, mm -hmm. uh, Louis Carton, uh, I think he's yeah I consider him as exceptional because uh, at that time he illustrates uh, the um, the permanence of a way of collecting, but also facing the modernity because he was. A military officer mm -hmm. he was a diplomat he was um, um, a doctor as were uh, Choiseul Bouffier or Lord Elgin or also uh, as uh, was uh, Charles Thomas Newton who was first a consul in the IGNC and then who went back to the British Museum to be a curator mm -hmm. so he's in the continuity of this phenomenon, but he also organized excavations from a very modern point of view with um, with a, with a stra um, les couches stratigraphiques with strategy oh actually for, for, with a, a, a huge respect on mm -hmm. um, on archaeological techniques at that time uh, i said that most of the time people were focused mainly on objects mm -hmm. here he, uh, louis carton he kept fighting not only for objects in mm -hmm. Carthage, he was interested in the preservation of the whole site not only the bel objet and uh, it's a very modern conception to be interested in a uh, in a complete site, in a complete region, not only objects to feed the museums. Mm -hmm. And also he, something is quite interesting, not to say funny, because he was a guy I wouldn't have a cup of tea with him because he, uh, he, he's, uh, he's said to be very, um, very exigent, very provocative, very... But, and he had many, many, many arguments with the official department of the Département des Antiquités, who was uh, constituted in the 70s or 80s, if I well remember, and he was not part of this department. He kept fighting for the constitution of this department, but that means he really hoped to be the head of this uh, of this department, but he was not because he was a doctor, first of all. So he kept conducting uh, excavations for himself. Uh, he paid for that uh, for those excavations, and the, um, this way of perceiving the antique Tunisia as a, um, um, as a whole, as a two is very different from the from the way of collecting we had at the time mm -hmm. great if i if i can say so just i i found in 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 your paper very interesting uh, uh, remark that it was in one way a disaster that let's say the places were completely destroyed and then yeah. one cannot just rearrange the context this is exactly. this was the catastrophe of especially of this this period of uh, of uh, excavations and in one way also of the art market this is this is uh, but in one way it was 
it, it, it lasted quite a long time. When we speak about, let's say, the grave diggers and everything, that is almost till today in, in, in let's say, in Turkey and so on. Now the, the market is, let's say, hopefully controlled. Not really, yeah. if one sees what's Not going completely, on with but China. Uh, yeah. But <laughs> definitely but more this, than at that time. Yes, of course, of, of course. course. But, uh, Thank but God. this was really, really a disaster. So the archaeologists and historians have now to reconstruct the places which were destroyed through mm, uh, through this gear to 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 collect the objects that's true historians and um historian of arts but also historians of archaeology have to reconstitute the context which was completely destroyed uh, mm -hmm. by excavating not in a not in an ethical way, not in a technical way. It was a real disaster. So that's that's why I wanted to point out that this is a cultural disaster. This is a real cultural disaster made for aesthetic reasons because those objects were very beautiful. So they wanted to study those objects, mm -hmm. but the context was lost, completely lost. A real archaeologist is focused on two things, the object, and uh, the more beautiful it is, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the best it is. But what is also very important, not to say even more important, is the context. Mm -hmm. when, the, when the context is, uh, is lost, when it's vanished, we lost something which is irreplaceable. We, we can't replace, we can't reconstitute a context. So we try as much as possible with the growing, with the drawings, with the, with the first pictures who, uh, which were made on the site, but it's, it's sure it's something we, um, which was, we have lost mm -hmm. forever. And now for um, the African antiquities, I'm far from being an, um, an African specialist. So I won't talk about a lot, but something I'm quite concerned by is um, if the, those uh, remains, those African remains, those African artifacts were sent back to Africa, society considerably evolved. So the local society will also have to reappropriate themselves, those objects, which were them before. Mm -hmm. So we have we are facing a double cultural challenge mm -hmm. to reconstitute the context and also what to do in the 21st century with those objects. Is that a good idea? We keep it, we keep them, sorry, we keep them in modern museums, uh, Occidental museums, such as the Louvre, the British Museum, uh, the Kunst Historisches Museum in Vienna, or uh, either um, also in Berlin, or shall we send back to Africa? It's not, it's not fair, it's really not fair that uh, we have our museums full of objects from a continent which is not ours. And, uh, the Africa is empty. Mm -hmm. But also the role of a museum is not to say, this is Greek, this is Roman, this is from Ghana. This is, it's uh, the role of a museum, it's to enhance the, um, the human dignity in works of art. So it's also the role of a museum to gather artifacts from all over the world to uh to to confront them to each other to enhance yeah the human skills in art in uh in the arts so it's it's very it's, interesting um, yeah yes. it's a it's a very interesting debate in interesting debate and complex and with moral aspect with 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 yeah, moral aspect juridical aspect considering mm -hmm. that uh, the legal framework mm -hmm. was not the same mm -hmm. at all from the uh, in the 19th century we mm -hmm. considered at that time it was fair because we had an unfair id in uh, in the occidental culture that it was um, um, that europe was superior 
to yes, other, yes, yes, other yes. countries. This colonial approach and this cultural exactly. robbery, which was creating this disaster, which you mentioned. Yeah. 